Hey friends, welcome to Doxology, Praise and Prayer in the Psalms. I know God's got a lot in store for us today, so let's jump right in. So how about grab a cup of coffee and a pencil and your Bible and a workbook and let's get going. Come on, follow me. Greetings. Welcome to Lesson 3 in Doxology, Praise and Prayer in the Psalms. I'm Heather Underwood and I'm here with Jason Collins. We're going to be studying Psalm 19 today, but we're going to start with prayer and with the scripture reading. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have created the heavens and the earth and everything in it, and it all points back to you, uh, the intelligent designer. Lord, you have given us uh, your scriptures, your law, to guide our hearts and to point us to you. And we can know you, Lord, through your son, Jesus Christ, and for the ability to know you so that then we can worship you, we thank you. And so reveal yourself to us in our time together and in Psalm 19, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warmed, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That final verse of Psalm 19 might be very familiar to you. Um, you might have heard it before a sermon or before a Bible teaching. It is most appropriate that we pray that prayer when we start studying scripture because we want to make sure our hearts are in the right place so that we're meditating and thinking about what God is wanting to teach us, and so that our worship of Him may be glorifying to, and pleasing to Him. Psalm 19 is a psalm of praise, and in it we see the theme of God is revealed. God is revealed in three sections here. We see that in the first section, God is revealed in creation. The second section, God is revealed in His Word. And the final section, God is revealed or He is working in us. So we're going to walk through that today and discover where God is revealing himself. Have you ever stepped outside and stopped in your tracks, been in awe of the scene that you saw before you? Maybe it was a sunrise, maybe it was a sunset, maybe it was a rainbow or a butterfly or something else beautiful as part of creation. This is God revealing himself as the wonderful creator to us and that we should stop and we should be in awe when we see those beautiful things. And I'm a lover of nature photography. I love taking pictures of 
anything beautiful that I see, whether it's a pine cone or a sunrise. Um, the picture that is in the booklet for this section is one of the pictures from my front porch. I see the sunrise every day and I try to get out there and um, admire the creation that God has given us. But I'm not admiring the creation for what it is. I'm admiring the creation for who it is revealing to me. And that's what we see in this first section, verses one through six, that God is revealed in creation. Creation reveals the creator to us. Verse one, the heavens declare, very strong word declare, that it's proclaiming with a loud voice, telling us who the creator is, that we have no excuse for not knowing that there is a wonderful creator. And Paul reiterates that and says it even further in Romans chapter one, verses 19 through 20. He says, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was, was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Creation shows us who the creator is. We have no excuse to not know that there is a God and a wonderful God. So you're you're right on with uh, the heavens declaring the glory of God and we can know God through creation and really the modern 21st century catchphrase for that is intelligent design that uh, creation points to an intelligent designer that created everything and made it all work together and this psalm really points to the intelligent designer who is the Lord. Well who is this God that is revealed to us in this first section? The heavens declare the glory of God. That word God in verse one in Hebrew is Elohim, which means the mighty one. The same word that's used in Genesis chapter one, verse one, God created the heavens and the earth. Now I understand about this word Elohim that it's plural, it's not singular. So, so it shows us that God is our triune God, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who are active in creation. This also reveals God's creative and powerful name. He is the mighty one that he can do all of these things in creation and in us. Psalm 19 is a morning psalm. It speaks of the daytime and the sun. We see throughout this first section that God has set a tent for the sun. It comes out like a bridegroom and it's like a strong man running its circuit. So we see that this is all about the daytime versus Psalm 8 is another creation psalm, but it is a psalm for the evening. It talks about the nighttime and the wonders of the nighttime creation. As we see that the sun is part of God's creation, we are reminded that we are not to worship the sun. This is not a sun God that we owe worship to. This is part of God's creation who reveals himself to us. And Deuteronomy 4, 19 warns us when you look up into the sky and see the sun, moon, and stars, all the forces of heaven, don't be seduced into worshiping them. The Lord your God gave them to all the peoples of the earth. So the sun and the rest of creation is merely revealing to us who the creator is. We are not to worship them. When we go outside, we may see all these wonderful things and think, oh, that's so beautiful. Look at that wonderful butterfly. Look at that beautiful bird. But they are only to point us to the wonderful creator behind that creation. So that was section one. In section two, starting in verse seven, we see that God is revealed in his word. Now the word, another word for that is the Bible. We have the entire Bible to reveal to us who God is and Psalm 19 verses seven through 11 tell us that God is revealed in his word. Now, because it comes after the first section where God is revealed in creation, we can know God through creation, but we can know him as a personal God in the second section. And who is this God that is revealed in this second section through the word? The word Lord there in your Bible should be all capitalized. And when you see that, it references the Hebrew word Jehovah. And the meaning of Jehovah is, I am who I am. Now that may sound familiar. Exodus 3, when Moses encounters the burning bush, he says, who should I tell the Israelites is sending me to them? Why would they listen to me? And God says, 
tell them, I am who I am has sent, sent you to them. So this is the same word that Moses encounters as the revealed name of God. And this word Jehovah is used over 6,500 times in the Old Testament. Hmm. It's a very personal name. It is revealing who God is. It is re revealing his eternal nature, past, present, and future. So when we see that Jehovah is revealing himself in his word, we know that we can get to know him on a very personal level. Now, people may get to know Elohim, the mighty God in creation, but unless we get to know Jehovah, the personal God, we can never truly know him. We need to see him through his word in order to know him personally. When we need to have the word of God to reveal to us the character of God, Throughout the Old Testament, names were very important. Names revealed a person's character or expectations about a person. And we can also see the many names of God given in Scripture are revealing to us who He is and what He does for us. Jesus even says, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. Many names for God that we can get to know as we walk with, with God and we can, He can reveal Himself to us in those different names. So we need to know the Word of God in order to understand His character. And God's Word is the centerpiece for believers. We always need to go back to God's Word in order to check our beliefs, to check what we hear. Anytime we're hearing Bible study or preaching, we need to always take it back to God's Word because that is the truth. We see here in this section that the law of God, the law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Our, the precepts of the Lord are right and the commandments of the Lord is pure. And God's word does not have these attributes of being perfect and sure and right because we say they are. They are right because they come from God, because God is right. Just as last week in Jeff's presentation, he says, why does God love us? Because God loves us. It's the same thing that God, God's law is perfect. God's law is sure because he is sure, because he is perfect. That doesn't come from anything other than who God is. Now our neighbor might argue with us and say, well, who's to say that God is right? And who's to say the Bible is right? Maybe it's wrong. Only because God is right does it make God's word right. We see in Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the Bible, but it talks all about God's word and the commandments of God and how important it is. And some of those words are echoed here in Psalm 19. Um, in Psalm 119, verse 72, your instructions are more valuable to me than millions in gold and silver. Verse 127, truly I love your commands more than gold, even the finest gold. And verse 130, the teaching of your word gives light, so even the simple can understand. God's law is perfect because God is perfect. God is the one who determines what is right. We see that in verse 8. And moving on to verse 9, we see that the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Now, what does that mean, the fear of the Lord? That may seem like an old-fashioned word. But fear really means reverential trust, trust with reverence or awe behind it. And we can read in Psalm 90, verse 11, Who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. So awesome fear that we are in awe of who God is, of what he does, and what he does for us. So as we move to the third section, we see that God is revealed in us, or He works in us. And He reveals what is inside our hearts. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And in Luke 6, 45, we read that our hearts reveal who we are. Now, when I'm talking about heart, I'm not talking about that muscle inside our chest. I'm talking about the essence of who we are. It is our being, our, our very center is our heart. And what comes out of us is what is revealed of who we are, truly are. It reveals our character. And God wants to be not only in our hearts, but forming our hearts to be like Him. 
So we can really approach these last three verses, 12, 13, and 14, as a prayer. In verse 12, pray for cleansing or forgiveness. In verse 13, pray to be kept from future sin. And verse 14, pray to stand on Christ, the solid rock. Now, who is God that is revealed in this final section? There are two names of God revealed here, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The Hebrew words, Jehovah Tsuri, God, my rock, and Jehovah Goeli, God, my redeemer. We need to know God as our rock and our redeemer, the one who helps us stand firm and the one who redeems us because we all do need redeemed. We all need saved. So as we go through this entire Psalm, there are four names of God revealed to us. In creation, it's Elohim, the mighty one. In God's word, it's Jehovah, I am who I am. And as we pray and get to know God on a personal level, we understand him as God my rock, Jehovah Suri, and God my redeemer, Jehovah Goeli. The more that we get to know God, the more that we worship him. So as he is revealed, we give our worship to him. And I'd like to close with a quote from theologian G. Campbell Morgan. If our rock were not our redeemer, we would be without hope. If our Redeemer were not our rock, we might be afraid. So let us never forget that our redemption has in it the strength of the Mighty One. So be blessed, friends. Thank you for being in this study with us today.